So if you have your Bibles with me, you can turn to the book of Habakkuk, and it's kind of fitting because this teaching was obviously being worked on well before uh, the events that took place last night, but it's going to be very fitting uh, as we talk through what Habakkuk is walking through uh, in Judah during this time and where we find ourselves in America today. And so Habakkuk's name literally means to embrace or to wrestle, to embrace or to wrestle, and so he is wrestling with God throughout the first chapter of this book. He's trying to find answers for the problems that he's seeing and for the evil that he's seeing around him in the world. And so he's wrestling through these things and he's wrestling through questions like you and I have, like for example, why do bad things happen to good people? Or God, if you're a good God, why do you allow evil in the world? How can evil be here if you're such a good God. And God, why do certain things happen in my life when I'm just trying to follow you and do what's right, but yet circumstances change and I walk through these difficult times? I think all of us have been in, at, at times in our life where we've had questions for God about the things that we're seeing around us. And that's where Habakkuk finds himself today. You see, what happens is we get so wrapped up in our circumstance and in the stuff going on around us that we take our eyes off of Jesus and we focus on our circumstances. And so on your outline, as we open up today, I want you to write this down. Habakkuk's story deals with the problem of walking by sight, not faith. It deals with the problem of walking by sight, not faith. What happens when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we focus on our circumstances and not on him? You see, there's a seeming disconnect for us about what we know about God and the circumstances that we're living in around us. And I was reading a book I'm going to share from a little bit later on, but in there he shares a story of a missionary couple. They get married and then shortly after feel called to go into the mission field. And so they go to Peru to be missionary pilots. <clears throat> and uh, when they get there, they, they're there for a few years and they decide they want to adopt a child. And so uh, they have this boy that they've been working with and they adopt him and becomes their son. And then a couple of years pass and there's this baby girl that they want to adopt. And so they're walking through the process and it says they get on the plane to fly to the capital to f fill out the final paperwork and make the adoption final. And when they get on the plane, they fly back to the missionary base. It says on the way, there was a mix up with the Peruvian government. They scrambled fighter jets and shot their plane out of the sky. The plane crashes, husband survives, but the wife and baby girl both pass away and lose their life. And we look at situations like that and we struggle to see Jesus. And I think all of us know people in our lives who have done great things for the Lord and we struggle and say, why would they be walking through these things when they're just answering the call that God has put on their life, yet this is the outcome. And so we wrestle through these situations in our lives. You see, the major theme of Habakkuk is gonna be overcoming life in the valley. Overcoming life in the valley. There's times in life where we're walking through a struggle, things seem so low and it's really hard to keep our focus on God. And so we're going to do a quick survey of the entire book. It's three chapters. We're not going to read all three chapters, but to give you a quick outline, chapter one is where Habakkuk questions God. And so he goes to God with a list of questions, trying to gain understanding for him about what's going on in the world around him. And then in chapter two, God speaks back to Habakkuk. And so Habakkuk listens to God. And then in chapter three, Habakkuk finds himself in a place of worship that despite everything going on around him, he can still find himself in a place where he can worship the Lord. And this will take place in the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel has fallen at this point. And then in 640 BC, it says that Judah had this great revival in the land. That King Josiah had turned the nation back to God, that he got rid of all the idols and they were worshiping the Lord. And then about 20 short years later, where the book of Habakkuk picks up, it says they've gone from this great revival back to great wickedness under King Jehoiakim. And so Habakkuk would have seen the mountaintop, would have seen the revival, would have seen what it means to have a nation following the Lord. And now he's seeing what happens when we completely walk away from the Lord and he is having trouble putting those pieces together in his mind. And so in chapter one, verse one, we see Habakkuk approach God with his first question. So chapter one, verse one, it says this, the oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw, how long, O Lord, will I call for help? And you will not hear. I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? 
Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. And so Habakkuk here lays out a series of questions for God. And on your outline, the first question that he approaches God with is this, God, why don't you seem to care? God, why don't you seem to care? I've been coming to you and asking these questions and I'm getting nothing back from you. And it's interesting as you read through this and you see what he's wrestling with, the wickedness and the contention arising, it's almost like a prophecy for us today as we look at the world around us and we see the violence and the evil and all of these things taking place in the world around us. And so he lists these multiple issues for the nation of Judah, the wickedness, the violence, destruction, the people are perverse. And he says it's from everywhere, from their government to the courts, to the people. We are seeing wickedness all around. So Judah is in complete disarray and Habakkuk is mourning over the sin of his people. And then in verse five through seven, we see God's first response to Habakkuk. And you can kind of sense a little bit of sarcasm here as God speaks back. He says, look, among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. Before behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are also the Babylonians, same group of people. So I'm raising up the Chaldeans that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared, and their justice and authority originate with themselves. So God takes his time to answer Habakkuk and says, look, I'm here. I see what you're talking about. I understand your question. But my response for you, Habakkuk, is that I am going to intervene. And how I'm going to intervene is I'm going to send an even more wicked nation, the nation of Babylon, to take over the nation of Judah. And so his response was probably not what Habakkuk was expecting, definitely not what he was hoping for to hear from the Lord, because now he's saying, you know, we're, we're bad, we're doing bad things, but you're gonna send an evil, even more evil nation to come and take over your people. But I love that in this verse he says, I'm doing something in your days that you would not believe if you were told. And I think for some of us, we don't want to know what God's response is to our situation because we just wouldn't believe it. God, that's how you're going to deal with the situation? And so he says, you wouldn't even believe it if you were told. So this prophecy will be fulfilled not long after this takes place. He has this conversation with God about 20 years after that, uh, from about 605 BC to 585 BC, is that the Babylonians come in to Judah. They overthrow the nation. They exile them out of the land of Israel and they make them, some of them slaves, some of them they take into Babylon, like Daniel, if you read the book of Daniel, during this time as well. And so this prophecy would be fulfilled. And so Habakkuk hears the Lord and he hears his response, but now he struggles to understand his methodology. So skip down to verse 12, Habakkuk speaks back to God. He says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? So on your outline, question number two that Habakkuk has for God is this, God, why would you let evil prevail? Why would you let evil prevail? So seemingly you don't care, and then you finally respond, and your response is that you're gonna let an even worse nation overthrow us, and now you're letting evil prevail. And he says, your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You can't even look on wickedness with favor. Why would you allow this to happen? And so Habakkuk starts to wrestle with the very nature of God at this point. God, you're a good, loving God, but your response is to let your people be overthrown and taken over. And he's having trouble reconciling these things in his mind. You are too pure to approve evil. And we've all been here before. When we see events unfold like last night and things in the world around us, we get to that point where we struggle and we say, God, why are you allowing this? Where are you in the midst of all of these things? How can you allow evil to take place? And we start to wrestle. And this is where we have that crisis of faith. 
You see, for some of us, maybe we've been praying for something from the Lord, we've been praying for healing, we've been praying for uh, blessing, whatever it is in our life, but we have yet to hear from God, we have yet to receive the blessing of the promise from the Lord. And so we face this situation where we have a decision to make. And it's either, either I can keep pushing myself through the valley, this deep point in my life where I don't understand why I'm walking through this situation, or we can choose to walk away and give up. I know, I know people in my life who, have, who prayed for things and the Lord didn't give them the answer they wanted or give them the response they wanted. And they said, I can't serve a God who does these things. And so they choose to walk away. Or we can choose to have faith and believe and continue walking and pushing through the valley. See, we know God and his promises, but maybe we aren't seeing them play out, play out in our lives right now. But we know that God is a God of his word. And so what I wanna do now is show a very powerful illustration of our lives, as we look at our life, a lot of us, when we give our lives to Christ, we expect things to kind of be smooth sailing and maybe a couple bumps along the way. Uh, but I worked with our graphic team this week to come up with this great illustration for us of what our lives look like. And so we're gonna put that up on the screen for you. It took us a week to come up with that one. <laughs> that's about the extent of my art skills, I can tell you that. <clears throat> but that's what our life looks like, right? And so it's not this straight line or a straight curve up, but we have these mountaintops and these valleys that we will walk through in life. And when we're on the mountaintop, it's really easy to serve the Lord, right? Everything's going well, things are going right, you know? So it's really easy to worship in those times. What happens after the mountaintop is we find ourselves in the valley. And sometimes it might be a little dip and sometimes it might be something absolutely devastating in our lives. I know that there are people in here that we've been working with that are walking through some very difficult situations, some very deep valleys that are trying to work through it and reconcile these things in their life. But we have a choice. Do I keep climbing up the mountainside or do I retreat and run away? Because I can't serve a God that allows me to walk through this situation. So on your outline, you can write this down. We must endure life's valleys in order to reach the mountaintop. We must endure life's valleys in order to reach the mountaintop and not only endure and push through, James puts it this way in James chapter one, verse two, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So don't just endure and make it through, but find joy in what the Lord is doing in your life as you walk through this situation. And I know that can be very difficult for us, but consider it pure joy. And then finally, Habakkuk approaches God one last time and nothing has worked yet, so Habakkuk switches gears and is gonna use a little fishing analogy for God. Maybe this will work uh, when, I, when I call out my questions here. In verse 14 through 17, he says, why have you made men like the fish of the sea? Like creeping things without the ruler over them, the Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook and drag them away with their net and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incest to their, uh, incense to their fishing net because through these things, they, their catch is large and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slay the nations without sparing? So on your outline, the third question that Habakkuk has for God is this, God, why would you allow the wicked to prosper? Why would you allow the wicked to prosper? So seemingly God doesn't care, and then God responds, and he says, why are you gonna let evil prevail, but not only let evil prevail, but you're seemingly blessing the wicked. Their nets are overflowing, and they have way more than we do, and they have all these good things happening. God, why would you allow them to prosper? And so Habakkuk here is questioning God because you get the sense that, that like you and I, he kind of has it all figured out, right? God, if you just did these things, this is how it could work out and this is how it could work out better for all of us if you just do these things. But I don't know about you, but God has never exactly consulted me on his plans with the world. And that's probably a good thing, probably a good thing. But he doesn't really consult us on this stuff because he's God and I'm not. And he kind of knows the plan and knows how this plays out and I don't. But Habakkuk here is questioning and wrestling with these things. But on your outline, I want to make one quick point before we move on. It is possible to believe Jesus and wrestle with our faith. 
It is possible to believe Jesus and wrestle with our faith. You see, sometimes bringing our questions to God is a good thing because as we're on this faith journey, there are things that we want him to speak into and we want to understand for him as we grow in our faith. And Pastor Dan stole my thunder a little bit last week when he shared uh, this story. But real briefly, in Mark chapter 9, a father's bringing his son to Jesus to be healed. And it says, but if you can do anything, then take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cries out and says, I do believe, help my unbelief. I do believe, help my unbelief. And so there are times where we will wrestle and we'll ask questions and we have to wrestle through our faith. We don't lose faith in Christ, but we wrestle through our faith as we go through these times in life. And so chapter one concludes probably with more questions than answers for Habakkuk. And so he's looking for an answer of why all of these things are happening. And God says, look, you're not going to like my answer, but here's my answer, which causes even more questions and concerns for Habakkuk. But in chapter two, we start to see this transition taking place in the mind of Habakkuk as he goes from this place of worry and concern to worship in chapter three. So starting in verse, uh, chapter two, verse one, he's going to reveal four steps for how we can go from worry to worship. And he says this, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. So Habakkuk stations himself on the rampart. That's the part of the city wall where you would go and keep watch for oncoming danger and warn the people uh, when danger was coming. And so he retreats to a, a place of solitude and waits on the Lord. So the first step for turning our worry into worship on your outline is this, is to watch and listen. Watch and listen. So we bring our requests to God and then we sit back and we watch and listen. And what that means is we have to get all the distractions out of our life. We have to push all the noise out of our life. And we simply watch and wait and listen upon the Lord for what he is going to say. In Psalm 46, 10, it says, be still and know that I am God. And so we position ourselves in a place where we can hear from the Lord. And then in verse two, God responds to Habakkuk. And he says, then the Lord answered to me and said, record the vision and inscribe it on tablets. Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets. So on your outline, step two is write down what God reveals to you. The second step for turning our worry into worship is to write down what God reveals to you. And there's a couple reasons for this. Number one is simply that God wants us to remember. If you're a guy in here and your wife has ever said, hey, will you run to Publix and get four things for me? You might wanna write this down. Nope, I got it. You get to the store. If you're like me, immediately forget right? So you might come home with like two or three things that she had on the list for you, and then like five or six things that weren't on the list, but you said, we probably need this too. But you forget that one important thing. God says, look, Habakkuk, write it down. Write it down so you will remember. And these things become spiritual anchors for our life. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in chapter three, but they're the times we can look back on when God promised something and he showed up. And so we write them down. And the second reason is to remind people that God is a God of his word. He is a God of his word. And so here we are over 2000 years after this has taken place, reading the book of Habakkuk and able to talk about this because he was obedient and wrote these things down for us to have today to bolster our faith as we walk through the times that we live in today. And so our role is to seek and listen to the Lord, to write these things down, but then importantly, we need to share that message with people. We need to share the message that God gives us. And then in verse three, he gives us the last two steps. He says, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come and it will not delay. So in verse three, the first thing we see there, step three for turning worry into worship is to be patient and wait. And this is the fun part for most of us. Be patient and wait. I don't know about you, but patience isn't one of my strong suits. I don't like waiting for things, but we have to be patient and wait. The Lord says, the vision isn't yet for this appointed time, though it tarries, wait for it. So it's not gonna happen right now but you can believe it is going to happen. And so we have to be patient and wait. See, oftentimes when God promises something, that promise isn't something that's gonna take place immediately in our lives. 
You see this all throughout scripture. With Abraham, he was promised a son. And it says 25 years later, Isaac is born. David was appointed to be the next king of Israel. And 15 to 20 years later, that promise is fulfilled. And he becomes the next king of Israel. So 25 years, 15 to 20 years, all of this time passes before the Lord finally reveals and gives his promise to his people. So there are times where we just have to be patient and wait. And then step four is we continue having faith in God's promise. We continue having faith in God's promise. Despite we haven't gotten the answer yet, and despite the fact our circumstance hasn't improved, we continue to focus on the promise that he has given us. And that will pull us through these tough times. And then Habakkuk chapter two, verse four, God continues speaking. And this is the turning point for Habakkuk where his perspective really starts to change. And he says this, behold, as for the proud one, that's Babylon, his soul is not right with him. Then underline the next part of this verse where it says, but the righteous will live by his faith. The righteous will live by his faith. So the righteous will live by faith, not faith in what's happening around us, but faith in an everlasting, sovereign, loving, and unchanging God. That despite how bad things are here, our faith is in that. Our faith is in God. And Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us the definition of faith. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so Habakkuk starts to wrestle with this, that despite all of the evil in Judah around him, the righteous will live by faith. And from this verse forward, God lays out two paths. He addresses the Babylonians and the sin in the nation and how evil they are. But then during these things, as he's talking about these different points and how evil they are, he gives three assurances for his people. So how they can find comfort even during these times. So we're going to bounce through these real quick. In verse 5 through 19, uh, God gives five woes to the Babylonians. Anytime we see the word woe in scripture, it's a, uh, a prophetic warning to the people that he is talking to. And so God says this in verse 6. He says, woe to him who increases what is not his. He says, look, they are selfish people. In verse nine, woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. They are never satisfied and they never will be. In verse 12, he says, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. So these people are characterized by their violent nature. In verse 15, woe to you who make your neighbors drink. So not only are they living in sin, but they are leading other people to sin as well. And then in verse 18, what profit is the idol when its maker has carved it or an image, a teacher of falsehood? So they're worshiping other gods. And so God's saying, look, I get who these people are here, all the bad things that they're doing. And I get that my plans to allow them to take over the nation of Judah. But as he lays out this, these things, like I said, he gives assurances to his people. The first one we just talked about in verse four is that the just will live by faith. Despite the fact that they're selfish and they're violent and they're evil and wicked, the righteous will live by faith. We will continue to push through with our faith in God. And this verse is so important that the Apostle Paul quotes it three times in the New Testament, that despite what's going on around them, we will keep faith in God. And then in verse 14, he gives the next one. He says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. So the earth will know that God is all powerful and we will see his glory despite what's going on in the world today. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So we have the assurance of God's glory that even though the evil one is powerful and thinks he's right, God will ultimately triumph. And then in verse 20, I want you to underline the first three words of this verse. It says this, but the Lord, despite all of these bad things, the Babylonians are doing, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. You see, we have the assurance that despite what's going on in the world around us, that God is in control. This didn't catch him by surprise, but he is fully in control over the situation. So some of us need to interject that into our situation today, that little but the Lord 
phrase. Despite what's going on in my life, but the Lord is in his temple, but the Lord is still in control. And as we study through Habakkuk, it, it brings me back to the story of Job. Many of you guys have heard the story of Job. You know who Job is, but he was a guy that was, uh, he loved the Lord and he was incredibly blessed. He was wealthy, had a big family and everything was going well for Job. And then one day Satan comes to God and he says, look, I want to prove to you, God, that your people only worship you when things are going well. And God's response to Satan was, consider my servant Job. And so Satan comes down and says, within a matter of moments, Job literally loses everything in his life. It says that his children are killed, his cattle is killed, his servants are killed. He loses all of his wealth and everything. The only thing he is left with is his wife. And if you know the story, that is not quite a blessing for Job either. Um, You know, she basically says, it's your fault. You're the problem. You need to figure this out. And so Job goes from this place where he had everything a man could want to literally nothing in a matter of moments. You talk about the valley. So now he's wrestling and trying to understand, God, why would this happen? And for the next 37 chapters of the book of Job, he's in this wrestling match with God, this roller coaster of faith. There are times where he says, despite what happens, I'll still worship the Lord, but I have all these questions I don't understand. I don't know why this happened. And for 37 chapters, he questions God. And then in chapter 38, God finally responds to Job. And when he responds, he doesn't answer a single one of his questions. In fact, the response, when you read it, you're like, how could God say that? And so let's take a look at how God responds to Job. In chapter 38, verse three through five, he says, now gird up your loins like a man. I would be petrified if God said that to me. (laughs) Gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? And he goes on for the next few verses, just laying into Job. Who are you to question God? Who are you to question God? And it brings Job to the place in chapter 40, verse 4 and 5, where he says, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth once I have spoken and I will not answer even twice and I will add nothing more. And so on your outline, you can write this down. We won't always understand why things happen, but God is always in control. We won't always understand why things happen, but God is always in control. And see what happened is he had his focus on everything that was taken from him and not the fact that God was still in control despite what he was walking through. God is saying, look, let me be God, you be Job. You won't understand why or what is going on, but you let me continue to do what I do. And we often struggle with this concept. That can be really hard to hear when we know that God is a loving God, God promises healing and blessing in scripture, and we believe those things, yet we see this play out in Job's life. And his response is, Job, who are you to question me? And so I want to read you a quick passage uh, from a book I read. And it's all about just having a a meaningful and significant life. Uh, But there's one chapter on surviving unhappy endings. When I read through this, it like hit me right between the eyes. But here's what he says about this situation. Some of us are carrying around a glamour shot of God. Our view of God has been airbrushed and barely resembles the real thing. The view we carry in our heads reflects more of what we want God to look like than what he is really like. It is important that we let God speak for himself. Let me be God because I'm in control and decide what I allow in your life. The Bible is absolutely clear that God is in control over the affairs of the world and over the details of your life. The situation, whether personal or global, has not caught God off guard or surprised him. God is not up in heaven wringing his hands, wondering if this is all going to work out. The Bible is crystal clear that God is the sovereign king of the universe and nothing happens to me or to you without his knowing it. Some people, because of their pain, have decided to give God a makeover. They can't reconcile the pain in the world with a God who is loving and powerful. And I read through that and you put yourself in the situation of Habakkuk and you put yourself in the situation of Job and you realize that so often we try and put God in our box. 
right? We try and take the role of God, or we try and take the reins, or we try and tell God what to do, but we forget that none of this has caught God by surprise. That this doesn't change who God is or the very nature of God, that he is all-powerful, that he is loving, that he cares for us. He remains unchanged even when our circumstances change. And so his response to Habakkuk and his response to Job is your job is to be faithful and push on despite how deep the valley is, is to keep the faith in God, not in your circumstances and situation. Let me be God. And this is where we find Habakkuk in chapter three, where he goes from this place of worry to trust and faith so he can worship the Lord despite his circumstance not changing. Nothing changed for Habakkuk. In fact, it finally, it probably got worse for him when he found out, look, things are bad now, but they're only going to get worse. But he finds himself in a place of worship and he writes out chapter three, which is a psalm of praise to the Lord. And so we're gonna read through uh, parts of this, but starting in chapter three, verse two, he's gonna give us three lessons throughout this of how we can climb out of the valley and go from worry to worship in our lives. So chapter three, verse two, he says, Lord, I have heard the report about you and I fear. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And there are two things that jumped out at me about this. Number one is he's like, I've heard and I'm scared. I don't like what you said, God, but I'm gonna let you be God. Doesn't change the fact that I'm afraid and I'm scared, but the first thing he asked God for is to revive his work. Knowing the outcome, and that isn't part of the plan, this revival that he had seen years before isn't coming again, that God's laid out the plan that you're going to be taken over and that there's going to be a rough period ahead for the nation of Judah. But the first thing he says is revive your work. And it's such a reminder for us to, as the church that despite what we see in the world around us, you know, here at Calvary, we believe we're in the last days and things probably aren't going to get a whole lot better for us as we head towards the second coming of Christ and we pray and we await that moment but we don't stop praying for revival. We don't stop seeking the Lord and asking him to intervene on our behalf. And we certainly don't stop asking God for mercy upon us. So he says, revive your work. But knowing that's not going to happen, he says, in wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. We are your people. And so while this might happen, we know that your promise is that we are your people and we will come through on the other side. And so we will keep faith in these tough times. And then Habakkuk goes on to recall all of these times that God has shown up for Israel. In verse three and four, he says, God comes from Timan, the holy one out of Mount Paran. This is when he's talking about God, how he revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. And then in verse five, he says, before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. This is a reference to when God delivered the Israelites out of Egyptian captivity. And then in verse 11, it says, the sun and moon stood in their places. And this is when God answered Joshua's prayer to stop the sun in the sky so they could defeat the army of the Amorites. So what he does is he starts this psalm of praise by remembering God's faithfulness in the past. We talked earlier about the need to write things down so we remember and how those become anchors in our life. When we're walking through the next valley in our life, when we write these things down, we can look back and say, this is, these are all the times God was faithful in my life and he will do it again. And so we write these things down and we remember the past times God has shown up for us. So on your outline, there are three keys that we'll see in this changed perspective for Habakkuk. And on your outline, the first one is that Habakkuk starts by remembering God's faithfulness. He starts off by remembering God's faithfulness. Remember, Habakkuk's situation didn't change, right? Things weren't better for him at this point and he's on the mountaintop. He's still very much in the valley, but he starts remembering God's faithfulness. And then skip down to Habakkuk chapter three, verse 16, where he says this, I have heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bone and in my place I tremble because I must quietly wait for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. It's on your outline. The next thing he does is Habakkuk accepts what God is doing in the present. He accepts what God is doing in the present. Again, remember, circumstance didn't change, but he remembers the faithfulness of God. He accepts what he's doing now, and because he knows God is faithful, he can walk through whatever the Lord is doing in his life at this point. He's still afraid, but he accepts what the Lord is doing. 
And then finally, in verse 17 through 19, is my favorite part of the book. It says, though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olives should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on high places. So on your outline, finally, Habakkuk trusts in God's plan for the future. He trusts in God's plan for the future. His circumstance never changed, but he's relying on the past, accepting what God is doing, and he's having faith that God will restore them in the future because he is a God of his word. He is a God who will fulfill his promise. And so because of those things, he's able to pull himself out of the dumps, out of the valley, and climb his way back to the mountaintop, despite his situation not changing. Yet I will exult in the Lord and I'll rejoice in the God of my salvation. See, our faith remains in an unchanging God despite the fact that our circumstances will change around us. Despite the fact that God might not give you the answer you're looking for and he might give you the answer you're looking for but it might not be right now, we keep faith in a never changing God. I wanted to close today with, uh, I, I grew up in a bunch of different types of churches, but I have an affinity for, for old hymns. Um, any of you guys with me? Yeah? Um, I'm not going to sing for you, so don't worry. <laughs> but one of my favorite hymns um, is It Is Well. It Is Well. And I just want to read the first verse, and you guys probably all know it as well. But he says this, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And I love that. If you know the story, Horatio Spafford, the guy that wrote that um, hymn, his family was on a ship crossing the Atlantic and the ship sinks and he loses his entire family. And he writes down this thing and he says, look, whatever my lot, whatever I'm walking through, it is well with my soul because God is in control. God is sovereign. I may not understand it. I may not like it. I may not approve of it, but my role is to let God be God and I'm gonna continue to have faith regardless of my situation. If you're here today and you're walking through a valley, and I know that some of us are, I would encourage you to find somebody in here to pray with. Our prayer team's gonna be out in the care room after the service. Find somebody to pray with you and don't walk through the valley alone. Find a support system around you that will pray with you, work with you, and help you climb your way out of whatever situation it is. At the end of the service, we're going to have communion up front. I encourage you to come up and take communion. But my hope is that as we leave here today, that we're not trying to fit God into our box, but we have an acknowledgement that God is in control of our situation. No matter how dire it is, no matter how grim it is, that we continue to have faith, not in our circumstances, we have faith in a loving, everlasting God. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful for today and we're grateful for your word. That God, as we walk through these times in our life where we struggle, where we don't understand, and God, we walk through times of evil and we look at times around us and God, we certainly live in uncertain times, but God, our hope and our faith isn't in that, our hope and our faith is in you. And so God, I just pray today that as we uh, walk through these situations in our life, that we keep our focus not on the world around us, but we keep our focus on you. I pray specifically for those in the room tonight that are, are walking through a very difficult situation in their life, that you will continue to reveal yourself to them, reveal your love, your compassion on them. For God, we know that in these times, our hope is not in the world, but Father, we have the message of hope through the gospel, that because Jesus gave his life for us, that he rose again and that he is returning one day for his church, God, that is the hope that we have. And so God, I just pray that as we leave here today, you open up opportunities for us to share the gospel with those who need it, to share the hope that we have, that despite all the chaos going on and the political turmoil going around on God, that our focus is on Jesus. And that Jesus, you are the message that we carry with us wherever we go. 
We thank you for your word and the stories that empower us and equip us when we're walking through these situations that we can look back to the times where you were faithful and how you remain faithful for us as we walk through these times as well. Jesus, we love you and pray that you go before us this week. May you be glorified in all that we do. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You have a wonderful week. We will see you next weekend.